some folks claim to have found love at first sight. When we read Bereshit or Genesis chapter number 29, we should at least find curiosity at first sight, if not prophecy at first sight. Hi, this is Barry Phillips with 10-Minute Torah, day number three of Torah portion of Etsy. Let's go into chapter number 29. Here we read the following, beginning with verse 1. And Yaakov moved on and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field and saw three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and a large stone was on the well's mouth. And all the flocks would be gathered there. And then they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. Down in verse 6, uh, after inquiring about family, uh, they said, see, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. So there is a storyline that is taking place here, but I think if we look a little closer, we may see some symbolism that would spell out a prophetic moment for us. First of all, let's consider the idea that those who are the deeper sowed level writers of Judaism consider that the stone that is on the mouth of the well is none other than the stone of stumbling, the stone that the builders rejected from a Hebrew roots vantage point of following after Messiah Yeshua We equate those two terms, stone of stumbling, stone builders have rejected with him, with Yeshua. My question is, why would Yeshua cap a well of living water instead of freely granting access? Why is it required that all the flocks be in attendance before the stone is removed? Let's follow along a little further. There are three flocks there at the well when Yaakov arrives. Considering flocks to be Yah's people, he's often referring to us as his sheep or the sheep of his pastor, the flocks that belong to him. Which portion of us is comprised of three flocks? Yehuda is comprised in the southern kingdom, the house of Yehuda, of Yehuda, of Benjamin, and of Levi. So then the other nine tribes are under the house of Yosef, or Ephraim. It just so happens that Rachel is the mother of Yosef, and he is considered the head or the namesake of the rest of those tribes. So we have this division seeming to take place here. So they're seeking the living water of the well, but they have difficulty dealing with the stone by themselves. Unfortunately, Yehuda believes that they have the full understanding or the best understanding or even the right to the understanding of who Messiah is. Because of uh, doctrinal issues, because of church issues, because of a whole list of issues, um, they have trouble with Yeshua as he has been presented to them. On the other hand, the house of Yosef believes that they have the right, we have the right, understanding uh, of who Yeshua is or who the Messiah is. And so we war with one another about this identity and about this role and how it's to be brought to pass. So Rachel, her name means you. Evidently then, she is named after the family business. Interesting. Rachel, this prophetic uh, picture of the house of Yosef, brings in the rest of the sheep, the other tribes that are missing, And when she does, the one who carries the covenant, the one who possesses the lineage of the seed and the inheritance of the land, a type of Mashiach, rises up and with great strength and power removes the stone from the mouth of the well and 
all the tribes are able to access the water. What a powerful picture that we have here. Notice I said that it was strength and power. Now, we oftentimes, by comparison of Yaakov and Esau, consider that Esau was this uh, great bulk of a man, muscular, hairy, a man of the field, rugged, he manish and that because Yaakov was a man of the tents, more than likely not cooking with mama in the cook tent, but rather studying in the yeshiva tents. Uh, Rashi suggests that he is a student of Shem and Eber, Shem the son of Noah, both of whom would have been alive throughout uh, Yaakov's uh, early life at least. And so he is a studious man. He is a man that is inquiring in his mind. But it doesn't mean that he is a wimp, that he has a lack of power or a physical ability. He proves this consistently in his life. Later on, he's wrestling with a messenger being all night long. That takes some level of strength. And so Yaakov rises to the task and removes the covering of the revelation of Messiah. Life-given water, then, is access. What also is interesting here is that the pattern continues in that Yaakov finds his wife at the well. Interesting. It is said that Abraham found or met Sarah at a well, so say some of the um, rabbinical writers. Yitzhak, uh, his wife, was found at a well. Moshe found his wife at a well. And in a manner of speaking, in Yochanan, or John chapter number four, Yeshua found part of the bride at the well, the well in Samaria. So this life-giving well, this, this place of springing waters of revelation, is where the bride is encountered. What does Yaakov do? He rises up and kisses Raquel. Well, that may have been a little inappropriate at the moment, but he knew that he had found what he was looking for, who he was looking for. Oh, to have the bridegroom kiss the bride. Folks, we need two things that are already revealed. We need the power of Yeshua, our Messiah, to open up the wells of life-giving water and let us drink in these last days. We have been divided. We have been overwhelmed. We have been discouraged. Many have struggled with COVID and other uh, issues, i put it that way, circumstances. Um, many have lost loved ones due to COVID and other things that have arisen. Um, it hurts. People are struggling. What we need is an outpouring, a bringing up, a spring of the waters of life up out of the earth to water the flocks of Yah's people. And we need the intimacy with the bridegroom. We need to feel the love and the presence of Yeshua. We need those scarred hands to be laid on us and receive strength and encouragement and hope from him. Thirdly, we need to see the tribes come together. Notice that uh, Yehuda, the house of Yehuda, is there waiting. They're in expectation. They're, they're longing for his return. They're looking for their opportunity to access this water. They're, they're thirsty. But we need the house of Joseph, represented here by Rachel, to bring the other tribes. We need to find those who belong to us. We need, we need to assemble the flocks. And there needs to be powerful, capable, anointed leadership that will walk with the sheep and shepherd them properly and with great compassion and bring them to Messiah. 
May we find him together. We'll talk further on these things tomorrow. Till then, shalom. 